Well, I did a PhD in, in Paris, and uh, that was, a, um, or no, I have to start with a master program. In fact, I did a master first, and that was on population economics, and we had two tracks. One was on OECD countries, and the other was on uh, developing countries. And so I had my first lectures on uh, issues around development. And so I got interested in this, and then I got a fellowship for a PhD, and that I did then in, um, on these uh, development economics issues. And because France has a bit of tradition to work on Francophone African countries, particularly Western Africa, and so I started to work on Cote d'Ivoire. And then later on I got involved into a project on Burkina Faso that was in 2000, I think, and since then I work on Burkina in particular. Yeah, I think that's quite interesting and very often it's uh, surprisingly a bit in your. So we see, I mean, for many developing countries, we see really a trend of rising food prices. It was very visible, of course, in 2008 when we had the global food crisis. And, um, of course, people somehow deflate their data for regional price variation, but it's often very poorly accounted for if you look at it over time. And if you have a phenomenon where you have differential inflation, so where different goods have different price dynamics, and if different income groups, so across the income distribution, people have different consumption habits. So typically the poor, of course, have a much higher food share in their consumption than the rich. Then this alone can lead to rising inequality. But you do not see it if you just deflate your income distribution with one common consumer price indicator, say a CPI. So you need, in fact, to deflate the, um, say, consumption figures by the uh, inflators that are specific to these uh, population groups. So that means you have to take into account that the poor consume much more food in relative terms than the rich. And Burkina Faso is one case in point where you see that uh, food prices are rising uh, quite uh, tremendously and um, the food share among the poor is around uh, 40 to 60 percent and for the rich it's more, say, if I say the rich I mean the, say the upper uh, quintile, it's more around uh, 20 to 30 percent. And so the purchasing power of the poor is continuously eroded and this increases inequality. Well, it means that, uh, of course, poverty is um, not declining as fast as it could. So we have in Burkina Faso, for instance, a gross elasticity of poverty of minus 0.5. So that means that for 1% of economic growth, you only get half a percent of poverty reduction, whereas in many other countries, this is rather around 1, if not 1.5 or even higher. So it's just, it uh, reduces enormously the potential leverage growth can have for the poor. Uh, and in terms in, of policies, it means that something has to be done about this food price inflation. Yeah, you see very often, in particular in Africa again, that uh, in fact the, the figures that you draw from national accounts draw in fact quite a positive picture. Uh, if you look at uh, macroeconomic uh, growth figures, then you see that many countries seem to do quite well. And so many people conclude very rapidly, in fact, that poverty also must go down and that household incomes are rising, say, in pair with these uh, macroeconomic figures. But if you look then uh, into the microdata in detail, then you see that very often there's quite a difference. And, and first, there are, of course, conceptual differences between uh, the uh, macroeconomic data and the household surveys. So GDP is definitely not the same as uh, household income. And so there are good reasons why the trends are different. 
Um, but then, of course, the, the household income is very often also ignoring an important, important part of the economy. So the, the top incomes typically are not reported in household surveys, but we see in, in many developing countries, in particular in resource-rich countries, that, of course, a lot of the macroeconomic growth, in fact, um, is first of all beneficial for a very small um, elite. And so um, then it's, again, not so surprising that we have maybe a different trend in the macroeconomic data compared to the microdata. Yeah, so we have in Burkina Faso and also a few other countries in that region, we have still very high population growth. And so population growth, of course, is not a sort of exogenous parameter. It's something that reacts to the economic environment, but at the moment it's such that it puts a lot of pressure on land and, and other resources, also public resources. So what we would need is uh, lower population growth, and this could be achieved by having a substantial structural change. So by basically um, increasing productivity to adopt new technologies. So on the one hand, in the agriculture sector, so that some of the pressure on land uh, can be uh, reduced, and in urban areas to upgrade some of the informal sector. In Burkina Faso, about 80% are active in the informal sector and do quite uh, low productivity activities. So um, if we somehow had more technology and higher productivity jobs, then also the economic environment would change in a way that people would start to have fewer children. So if you had more female uh, employment, if you had higher returns to education, these are typically the things that bring about these changes. So family planning can play a supportive role, but it's typically not um, the, the most important parameter in that, in that system. Well, on the one hand, um, WIDA has excellent contacts into the countries we work on, and that's important that we can interact. Of course, we interact with them within our own projects, but of course, we also want to make new contacts and to interact with people that work on other countries, maybe similar countries to the countries we work on. So that's simply excellent. So they really have a very, very wide network. And WIDA has excellent possibilities to disseminate research because of the size of that network and the links they have to policy and other think tanks, um, you can, by presenting here your work or publishing your work via wider outlets, you can reach many, many people. So that's really something I appreciate in coming to wider and working with wider. Thank you.